when I came back from my first deployment um, to Iraq, I, my first day back, I was in my office, and you can imagine I had 3,618 emails, an inbox about three feet high, and all kinds of concerns that needed to be taken care of. When in walks the chief of police, okay, go to VA. And he sits down and he says, I have a very serious situation that I need to talk with you about. He says, okay, sir, tell me about it. Well, he said, one of your emergency positions, they're mine, we didn't do anything people don't like, I want you to know. One of your emergency positions unplugged the Yaku tracker. Really? Well, that puts you in a situation because this was obviously a very important happening to the chief of police. Not only did that position unplug the Yaku tracker, but he was caught on tape, surveillance tape, unplugging the Yaku tracker. Okay? Now, I had no, honestly, no clue what a Yaku tracker was. Okay? I don't know if any of you folks in the audience do, but I didn't know. But, so I had to make a quick decision. Did I admit that I didn't know what a Yaku tracker was? Or did I just pretend I did, take it very seriously, and promise that it would never happen again? I did the latter, okay? And then I went to find out what a yacker tracker was, okay? Uh, so I found the physician who had unplugged it on surveillance tape and uh, said, uh, hey, gee, um, <clears throat> do we have something called a yacker tracker here? And he goes, yeah, right up there. And I look up next to the, to, the, to the little TV camera that shows us how many people are sitting in the waiting room waiting to be seen, it's usually fall. And there was a traffic light. I swear to you, a traffic light. You know, red, yellow, green? Yeah, okay. So um, I said, so okay, um, what is this for? And he said, well, uh, if the noise gets too hot, the noise level gets too high in the emergency department, then it turns to yellow. If it really gets too high, it turns to red and a big alarm goes off. <laughs> okay, folks, this epitomizes the concerns in the VA hospital. Number one, nobody in the emergency department requested or even knew they were going to put a Yakko track on. I found out later. And number two, you know, you guys have watched TV, doctor shows on TVs, right? An emergency department is a noisy place, okay? There are ambulances coming in, rolling gurneys down the hall. There are big carts going down, like crash carts and, and uh, x-ray equipment. And uh, if there's a code, you know, 10 people come running to the room. And there are all kinds of alarms going off all the time. So is this the place to put in a Yakka Tracker? I further investigated the Yakka Tracker and found out, guess who invented the Yakka Tracker? A kindergarten teacher, okay? And the Yakka Tracker is used in kindergartens to tell the kids when they're being too loud. So somebody thought we needed this in the emergency department at the VA. Okay, your tax dollars at work, folks, okay? And how did they catch my doctor unplugging it? And why did he unplug it? Because he thought the thing was ludicrous, stupid, and shouldn't be there. And they caught him on video camera because they put new little spy cameras in the ceiling of our emergency department while I was gone. So that they so that the police over in the in the police room watched everything that went on in our department. That's kind of creepy, you know, but they did. This is how your taxpayer dollars are spent at the VA, and these are some of their priorities. Now, when I first went to the VA back in 2006, I, uh, I interviewed there, and I was impressed. I want you to know that your VA in Little Rock has one of the nicest physical plants around. The emergency department is beautiful. It's lovely. It's well-designed. It's well-equipped, and the people were nice. And, and I realized that I was getting into, you know, a bureaucratic system. And this was my fifth directorship. I wasn't a newbie. I'd been, you know, around this bush before, but never in a government system. And I thought, what did it matter? You know, a little extra paperwork or, uh, you know, some bureaucracy and, and the ever-loving, you know, government.
the computers, but I can handle that. Oh, was I naive? Okay. You, the Yappa Tracker story is one of a gazillion. All right. I want you to know, however, that the doctors at the VA are second to none. I have never worked with better doctors in my department and out of my department. They have good, caring physicians. The other people who work at the VA, the clerks, the nurses, most of them are hardworking people who honestly want to take care of the patients. Now, so you say, what's wrong? Why doesn't the system work? The system doesn't work because it's a federal, unionized bureaucracy. Now, I, you know, we talk about bureaucracies all the time. And so I went back to my Webster's College Dictionary and looked up what is a bureaucracy. And here's the definition. A system of administration marked by lack of flexibility, excess regulation, Abundant red tape and proliferation. That's pretty good. I mean, this was a really old book. It was so old I couldn't find the copyright. Okay? This was an ancient dictionary, and that is what they said a bureaucracy was. Well, I tell you, they're right on target. They are absolutely right on target. The structure of the VA is reasonably simple. The, the VA has your, your local VA, like your, your VA in Little Rock, and, and then there's the VA in North Little Rock, which is part of the system. You probably all know that. And then they have what's called CBOX. And these are little outlying um, offices scattered about the state. Okay? So your local VA is part of a visit. They have a bunch of different VAs like Little Rock, Memphis, Shreveport, you know, and they'll, they'll be part of a visit. There are 16 visits. And then the visit reports to central office. Are you counting the number of bodies in administration here? Yeah, tons. Okay, so I look, I call central office heaven. Central office is the equivalent of heaven in the VA system. What their job is is to pass down edicts and demand performance and pass down performance measures that they want followed. Okay? It's very much like when you read the Bible, Moses, you know, receiving from God the Ten Commandments. That's why I call it heaven. Okay? They are basically somewhat clueless as to what goes on in the real world of medicine. Okay? And the performance measures that they demand for you to follow are interesting at best. I'll give you an example of one. Um, morning report, they were talking about the newest performance measure about a couple years ago, and it was that nurses should do patient education, okay? And your goal is to get 100% on the performance measures, because then you send it up to visit in central office, and they rank your VA. You know, you have rankings, you want to be high up in the rankings. So here's what the nurses did for patient education. Anything you talk to, to the patient about counts. If you're in the hospital and you're here for congestive heart failure, and so the nurse goes in and says, Hey, I see you're a smoker. And honey, you need to stop smoking because smoking is bad too for you. Click, and then check off patient education for this patient. That was worthwhile, right? These are how the performance measures work. They measure nothing. Okay? Um, another performance measure that they had set up was for the primary care uh, doctors. Primary care doctors are supposed to call their patients and let them know about their x-ray results and lab values, right? I mean, you go to your doctor and he calls you up and lets you know or sends you a letter or something. Well, so they set up an automated phone system to call the patients, okay? And have these little uh, pre-recorded little messages for the patient. And as long as somebody pushed the button, the phone and the phone was called and some automated message went out, guess what? You got 100% on your uh, performance measures. Now, nobody knew who answered the phone. It could have been the answering machine. It could have been the three-year-old granddaughter. It could have been the wrong number. Didn't matter. Got 100% on your performance measures. Now you see how in a bureaucracy, a system, the system doesn't work. What's the difference between the VA bureaucracy and the civilian world? 
where I had been intolerant to the behavior. The difference is, is that in the civilian world, quality patient care is paramount. You want to do it in an efficient and cost-effective manner. That every day, everything you do is focused on that. The doc here is shaking his head. He knows what I'm saying is true. What is the per what is the paramount goal in the VA? To meet the performance measures and follow the regulations. Doesn't work, folks, does it? Makes no sense. I'm talking to a group of people who are smart and have common sense. It's insane, right? Yeah, it's insane. Okay. Let me give you a, a few little examples in my own department. We see 28 to 30,000 patients in the VA of Little Rock, okay? I told you, this is my fifth directorship. All of my other departments, except one, which we started from ground zero um, and opened new, saw the same number of patients. How many doctors do you need to staff that volume of uh, emergency department? You need three 12-hour shifts per day. 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and a double covered doc, 10 to 10. That's 36 hours of physician coverage per day, okay? At the VA, how many doctors do you think we had? Well, we had six to seven per, 12, per 24 hours. That's 72 hours, 72 to 84, over. It's shocking, right? In my civilian emergency departments, if a patient from the time he came in the door, came in the ambulance door or came in the front door and checked in, until the time he went out of the door up to be, to be admitted or to be sent home, if that patient was in my emergency department longer than four hours, that patient became part of my quality management review. Why was he there that long? Okay? Yeah. Or we should be faster. At the VA, 28% of my patients sat in the waiting room longer than six hours. Okay? Yet we had twice the physician staff. Okay, what's wrong with this picture? Were the doctors goofs? No. When I went to that VA, they had two full-time physicians. Within a year, we had 15, counting me. And I hired them. And I hired them from the civilian world, where they saw those patients and were effective and were good doctors, okay? So, test case. Was it the doc who could function in the civilian world? Or was it the system? I say the system, folks. The, um, why can't the doctors function in the VA? And this comes down to why the waiting list. Because of all the insanity. Number one, how well do you guys type? Okay? I remember taking typing in high school. It was my hardest course. Okay? I had to go in an hour before school and to practice typing the stupid things we were going to type for class that day so that I could get an A in the class because I had to have an A because I had to get a scholarship because I wanted to go to college. Okay? It was my hardest course. The doctors type their charts. Okay? They all sit there. Doctors my age, Dr. Jack's age, you know, we don't type it out, okay? And we sit there and type our charts. Okay. Um, in addition, we have to go through multiple screens on a computer system to order one drug, five to be exact, to order one medication or one lab test or whatever. Okay, so I sat back and I said, hey, gee, um, this isn't a good deal. So I get deployed to Iraq again. And while I'm over in Iraq, I developed a computer system that was symptom related, okay? So the doc could go in, pull up, pull up what he needed, like shortness of breath, whatever. Everything was there. He put in his orders in three minutes, okay? Or less, probably two. Ask me if the VA said, thank you, Dr. Grayley, this is a good idea. And, uh, no, the nurse who was uh, in charge of the IT order entry system, no, a nurse, okay, not an IT person, uh, thought it was silly and uh, just said, never mind, we're not going to do it. Okay, fine, couldn't win that one. 
So I did a cost analysis study about this uh, typing your charts, because the charts were terrible, you know, three sentences, and they were awful, okay? And I calculated how much money the VA lost because the doctors were typing their charts. It was 1.2 million. Asked me if they allowed me to get a dictation system, yeah, for a few months, and then said, never mind, go back to typing. Um, other interesting things. Uh, our patients sit in the emergency department and don't go upstairs, okay, because there are no beds available. That's, a, that's believable, right? Except the beds mysteriously become available at 2.30 in the afternoon right at nursing shift change. All these beds miraculously become available. So our head nurse decided he was going to check this out. So he went upstairs one day at about 11.30 in the morning and went through all the wards and counted the, the rooms that had been vacated, where the patient had been discharged, the room was clean, it was ready for a patient. Guess how many he found? 20. 20. So he thought, this is very bad, okay? Our patients are sitting in the emergency department and can't get upstairs, and there are their beds up here. So he went to the, to the nursing director and reported it, and you know what happened? He was reprimanded for going up and looking for the beds. It was none of his business. It was out of his, uh, whatever you call it. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, and he was never to do that again. So a year later, they instituted a committee to try to, you know, get the beds to move faster and take care of this problem. We met for six months every week. We learned a lot and fixed nothing. This is classic VA meetings, okay? Um, other little things, like waiting for x-rays, okay? Your patient needs this CAT scan. Two or three times I went over to find out why my patient was in CAT scan for three hours when it took 30 minutes. Oh, no problem. Uh, they're over there because it was lunchtime. People are unionized, folks. They go to lunch when they want to go to lunch. They go on break when they're, when they're scheduled to go on break. And it doesn't matter that people are waiting. In the civilian world, do you think they would let CAT scanners sit unused? while techs were at lunch? No. They have a system where they're going all the time. Some of the hospitals I worked at were talking about using their CAT scanners 24 hours a day, bringing people in at night. Yeah, he's shaking his head. That's the world he lived in, okay? But we just let the patients sit in the hall and wait while they go to lunch. But the best story is the ultrasound tech. We're unionized. Mm -hmm. We need ultrasounds in the emergency department, or could need an ultrasound any time of the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? But the techs don't want to be on call, and they don't want to work after hours. So they're in a union, so they just go to the union and say, we don't want to work af uh, after hours or be on call. So they're not, OK? So the patient comes into our emergency department and needs a CAT scan. No problem. I can stand in my emergency department and see the University of Arkansas emergency department across the street, right? And furthermore, there's a walkway from the VA to the University of Arkansas across the street, right? So we just take our patients over there and get the ultrasound, right? Uh, sort of. We can't use the walkway. Some administrator at the VA doesn't understand what might happen to the patient if he has a problem in the walkway and whose jurisdiction it is. Therefore, we can't use the walkway, okay? Now, no problem. We have to get him over there. You can't roll him in the bed. You can't roll him in a wheelchair. You call an ambulance, okay? Oh, your tax dollars will work, folks. So, but you are not high priority on men's ambulance list because they're going to car wrecks and shortness of breath and chest pain and whatever. So, you know, you may have to wait a while, no problem. Uh, hours maybe. So you get an ambulance, ambulance drives across the street, lets a person out, he goes through the process there, gets his ultrasound, comes back, oh, how does he get back? They have to call an ambulance. We wait some more. And then he comes back, hours pass. Doesn't always matter, but it can matter. It can matter a lot if you have something that's going on that needs to be handled right away. 
remember the word emergency, okay? And I could name a few. Testicular torsion, about six hours, guys, okay? And I can name a few more, okay? But we have to go across the street in the ambulance. Now, uh, no problem. While I was on my second deployment to Iraq, one of the nurses up in the administration figured she'd take care of the ultrasound problem, okay? So, they had some extra money, and this is another thing that you have to worry about. You never, ever don't spend your money, okay? If the government gives you a million dollars, folks, you better spend it. Because if you don't spend it, you lose it. Right, you have to send it back. So we had a little extra money in the emergency department. Fund. So that nurse just ordered a really nice, expensive ultrasound machine for the emergency department. Great, walk home. None of the 15 doctors who worked in the emergency departments knew how to do ultrasounds. Duh. -uh. Okay, no problem. I went to my friends in Ohio and who teach ultrasound courses to physicians, set up a deal that they were going to come to Arkansas, teach us all how to do ultrasounds and use that new machine. But there wasn't any money for the course. I don't know where the machine is. I maybe they gave it to good people. Primary care is a big issue because that's where you're seeing the lists people are talking about. Okay? Why do your primary care docs? Why are they not able to see their patients? Well, in the real world, I, could, I now call it the real world, the civilian world, I'm sorry, that I shouldn't say it that way, but in the civilian world, a doctor sees, depending on his specialty, from 20 to 35 people a day. You know, follow-ups for, for surgeries and things are quicker, internal medicine stuff takes longer. Um, but 20 to 35 a day, okay? How many do you think they see in the VA system? Max they can schedule. Max they can schedule is 12. And the average number they see folks is nine. Nine per day. Now, is it because the doctors are lazy or goofs? No. It's the same reason the emergency physicians can't move patients. It's the system, okay? They're good doctors, They're, but the system just won't let them do it. Some of the CBOCs, you know these little outlying clinics? How many do they see? Ooh, three or four? You're paying for a clinic. You're paying for a staff. You're paying for a doctor. And you're seeing four patients? Your tax dollars are more, folks. Whoa, yeah. In the emergency department, when I first went there, when we saw a patient, and they needed to be sent back to their primary care doctor, uh, the rule was that they had to be able to get in within 90 days. 90 days, okay? We may have changed their anticoagulant, their diabetes medicine, who knows, you know, whatever. They needed to be seen. In the civilian world, it's the next day if the emergency department wants it done. Yeah, see, you say, I'm not making this stuff up, folks. 90 days. Now, they had a big change about three years back. They have to be seen now within 30 days. <laughs> okay, whatever. All right, that's why the lists. What do we do in the ED? We do lots and lots of useless stuff. We go to lots of meetings. We have morning meeting, Monday through Friday, every day for all the directors, all the departments, all the different administrators. And we have, I don't know what they call those, when you, when you buzz them in by TV, you know, all the CBOCs are, get to, we get to, they get to be, a, be part of it too, by some tele, television or something. I counted one day how many people were in the meeting. 52, plus all the representatives from the CBOCs. 52 every morning for an hour and a half. Oh, okay. Uh, you'd think the place would run like this, right, with all these meetings. No. We have... Then we'll have all kinds of special meetings that are set up to look at problems. They look at them. You know, you've heard President Obama. He uses this term. We'll, we'll, we'll look into this. We look into a lot of stuff, folks. The trouble is we never fix it. Okay? So, bottom line, um, there are big differences between civilian medicine and the VA. And the basic difference is the VA is a 
federally unionized bureaucracy. You can't make the employees do what they're supposed to do. If they do a bad job, you can't fire them. They either get transferred or promoted. This man here was in HR at the VA, sitting here shaking his head. It never happens. You cannot make people do what they're supposed to do. It doesn't happen. How could you run a business if your employees just could tell you no whenever they felt like it? Could any of you run that business? Uh, probably not. And then there's the bureaucracy part of it, the thing we talked about, the lack of flexibility, the regulations, the red tape, the proliferation stuff. A few interesting facts. The VA budget doubled since 2006. Last, this year, the VA is going to turn $450 million back to the government. In a previous year, a couple years ago, they turned a million back. So is it money that keeps it from working? Not a. What are our bureaucrats going to do to fix it? Throw more money at it. What will that do? That will get us some more administrators to make some more stupid rules, right? Good plan, folks. Okay, another little point. 42 facilities are being investigated now, not just one or two. 42 are being investigated. So in summary, it's a heavily laden bureaucracy that's unionized. It can't be fixed. Okay. And folks, here's the really good news. All of you go home and look at yourself in the mirror because this is what Obama plans for you. The VA is Obama's model of socialized federal health care. God help us. Okay? The answer, my solution, get the government, federal government out of our health care. However,
when Obama was elected the second time, he was a senior med student, and he was down here doing a rotation in Arkansas. And he turned to me and he said, Mom, give me one reason why I should be a doctor now. I couldn't. I couldn't at all. We have to take our lives back, and we have to get the federal government out of it. The market will, believe you, handle it. We're good. We can do it. But you've got to get the federal government out of it. And gradually give these people vouchers to go to the private world. Gradually give them vouchers to go to the private world. And gradually close this monster. That would be my answer. We owe it to our veterans and to ourselves. Edith, thank you. you. You did exactly what I would hope that you were going to do, and you knocked it out of the ballpark. I think, as, as we said in the beginning, the problem is not the doctor. The problem is the system. But everyone in this room knows that changing a federal system is, is almost impossible. I mean, so how do we do it? Well, groups like ours, maybe if, if this tape well, we can get it to some people that would actually hear what the real problem is and then start working from the bottom up instead of the top down uh, and, and, and other things. So, so again, we, we've now been informed. You've not heard this even on Fox News, what, what Edith presented today. And she made it very, very clear, very common sense what the problem is. You have, you, have, you have employees that, that, that can't be fired. You've got, you know, at 5 o'clock they close the doors. Uh, she probably didn't say that, but that everybody that, that's employed that way goes home at 5. You better not still be seeing patients. Um, you've got an electronic medical record that's impossible to use. Uh, that's what she was alluding to about the typing and the five pages. I mean, it's, it's just an impossible system. The reason that doctors can only see 12 people a day is because they can't see more because of the system. It, and so it's not just a matter of you're not permitted to see 12 more. You can see 12 more and get it all done the way the system is set up. Yes, John? She mentioned how so many people were involved in the narrow close meetings. That goes on all over the VA. Right. My old boss knew that I hated those meetings because rarely did anything come out of it. Well, people were just sit there wasting time in meetings. I mean, it's, it's just an amazing thing. Because coming out of the private civilian world, I mean, everything was done for efficiency. Everything was done to lower overhead, not increase it so that we look better on paper. I mean, you know, when I ran my own, my own clinic, my own corporation, any money that I wasted, that meant my bonus check was smaller. I didn't waste. I mean, I thank my employees who came to me with ideas to, to, to be more efficient and to cut back on costs. We're just the opposite, probably.